So there's a report last week out that Nancy Pelosi and her husband, who have combined assets, uh, are out here YOLOing on uh, options trading and derivatives trading, and they're making a killing, making millions and millions of dollars every single week uh, or or every single year uh, on this trading. And the trades happen to be really interesting timing, uh, and they always seem to somehow go in their favor. Now, this, to be clear, is happening as a conversation on both sides of the political aisle. Nancy Pelosi happens to be the person that folks are talking about this past week. About a couple of months ago, everyone was talking about a woman named Kelly Loeffler who uh, is on the Republican side. So this is not a Democrat versus Republican issue. This is a politician issue, a bipartisan politician issue. And so if we start to look at some of the data behind this, Nancy Pelosi, we're using her as an example because the Best Business Show research team uh, was out in full force overnight and was able to drum up a couple of interesting statistics. Uh, And and some of this, I think, came from Glenn Greenwald's new uh, piece on this. Some of it came from the old Google machine. So Nancy Pelosi and her husband were worth $41 million in 2004. Today, they're worth $115 million in 2018. So they're probably worth more than that today. So that is almost, uh, or is about 3X increase in their net worth since 2004 to 2018, about 14 years. Now, with the recent stock market highs, we would expect that to be much, much higher. So for her to be worth 115 or more million dollars as a net worth, the median net worth of Congress is just over $1 million. So Nancy Pelosi in 2018 was about 100x wealthier than her fellow Congress people. Now, some of that is because she happens to have been around for a long time and earning a six-figure salary for that length of time. Some of that also happens to be that her husband is a financial investor who appears to, by all accounts that we could find with the Best Business Show research team, appears to be able to uh, invest capital, risk capital in the market, and get a great return. If we pull up the chart on the wealthiest members of Congress, what you find is something that becomes pretty interesting. You start to find that many of these individuals have very, very high level of wealth. And you can see red and blue. It's both sides of the aisle. This is not a single political thing. So you see here, I think, what do we have? We have six people with over $100 million net worth in Congress. And some of these people, uh, I can't actually remember which one of the top three uh, were literally politician or uh, were entrepreneurs before. So they were able to build businesses and, and kind of acquired the wealth before they got into Congress. And then some of the people actually built the wealth while they were in college or in uh, Congress. And so when you start to even look at what is this three, uh, seven, this is the top 10 wealthiest members of the 116th Congress uh, based on the May 2019 disclosures. Uh, <laughs> they literally, the top 10 people have a net worth of over 50 million million dollars. Pretty crazy. And so I don't want to spend a ton of time on the individuals because I don't think that's frankly very uh, productive. But if we pull up one more chart uh, of Pelosi's investments by sector, this is back in 2018 was the data that we were able to pull. What you can see here is that the sector bias is somewhat real. So finance, uh, insurance, uh, real estate, etc., uh, is in the blue. And then you've got things like uh, communication electronics, you've got miscellaneous businesses, transportation, etc. So the first question that this brought up in my mind when I saw this was, should politicians be allowed to invest at all, right? If we think about politicians and the ability to build net worths of 10, 20, 40, 50, 100, 200 million dollars, should we allow them to invest? And I think when I was talking to Joe and John about this, the key thing is, You don't want poor politicians, right? This is counterintuitive. You actually don't want politicians that are poor. Why? One, the aspect or or the likelihood of fraud or of corruption or some level of uh, manipulation by foreign agents or, or governments, et cetera, becomes much higher when you have people who literally need the money. So there's probably some middle ground. Maybe it's not every single politician should be worth $200 million and that should be our goal. It also shouldn't be that every single politician should make $50,000 a year and be uh, kind of not well off and so that they're worried about making money rather than they're worried about actually governing the people. Now, the second aspect that came up was if I'm a politician and I make, I don't know what the exact uh, congressional salary is, but I think it's somewhere in, you know, 175,000, 175,000, so under $200,000, 175 grand. That is uh, a very high salary in terms of the average salary in America. 
But if you look at the what we would consider the smartest, the most successful people in America, the best entrepreneurs, the best innovators, the best investors, $175,000 is actually very low compared to that. And so would we be better off? Would we get better talent? Would we be able to attract better people, better governance, if we actually just paid, let's say, every politician $5 million a year? Right? Would that actually lead to the world's smartest, their best people wanting to have that job because they can make so much money doing it rather than having to make a trade off between should I go into politics or should I go and work on Wall Street and make more money or should I go into venture capital or should I go build a tech company, et cetera? Now, there's a lot of ramifications there, but I think that's a fair question as well. Should we just pay them a ton of money so that they actually end up attracting the best talent? And then the last question is that there's all sorts of uh, potential improprieties that can occur if you are a politician and you are aware of information that maybe the public isn't aware, uh, aware of. So for example, if I was aware of information inside of a publicly traded company and I bought or sold stock based on that information, then I could be charged with insider trading, right? I knew information that was non-public uh, but was material to the business and I made investment decisions based off of it with a publicly traded company. That is information inside of the company. But what if I was, for example, like the Kelly Loeffler situation, where uh, they were essentially told that there was going to be this pandemic, it was much worse than the, they were telling the public, and, and kind of all of these uh, various uh, briefings that they went to, and then there was some uh, trading that happened um, that were in affected sectors, and therefore they were able to either profit or avoid loss, right? Is that material, non-public information? Well, it technically isn't inside information to the company. It is just research information. And so how does that fit into it? I don't necessarily have an answer, but I think that's a fair component to, to the, uh, the question. John, I know that you had a really interesting point about, well, maybe it's not so much should they own stocks or should they not? Maybe it's should they be allowed to make the investing decisions versus somebody else? Yeah, so one of the decisions that a lot of people kind of toy with is should they put their money in a bond trust and have someone else basically manage their money for them uh, where they can't actually make any trades, they can't make any investment decisions, uh, but they know their, their money's in good hands, right? People do that all the time. I personally don't know the answer to this. I think there's a million different ways, right? You pay them more, you put their money in bond trust, you let them just trade whatever they want. I think the one thing people are really, really worried about is that Nancy Pelosi and Paul and Paul were basically sitting at dinner and she was like, hey, this is gonna happen. And he walked over to his computer and said, oh really, that's gonna happen and did some trades. Yeah, <laughs> I, I was gonna say the one thing that I think is important to remember too is the Stock Act that made all of this illegal essentially is not that old. It was, I think it was, yeah, 2012. Uh, they passed, Congress passed the, the uh, Stock Act, which essentially says any non-public information derived from an individual's, individual's position or gain from performance of the individual's duties or personal benefit is illegal. So that's, you know, less than a decade old at this point. Maybe the rules need to be iterated a little more uh, because from what we can tell, right, Paul did nothing illegal. They say Nancy knew nothing about the trades. Pa Paul were, is Nancy's husband. For pa those. Paul Pelosi is Nancy's husband. They say he did nothing illegal. Uh, Nancy didn't know about the trades. And, and to John's point, you know, were they sitting at dinner and talking? Who knows, right? That would make it a little more questionable. Uh, but I think it comes down to what you mentioned earlier, which is incentivizing people in the right way. So when you think about, yeah, pay helps, right? So if you pay someone a million bucks, two million bucks, three million bucks a year, that certainly incentivizes people to go chase after that career. The same way that doctors and lawyers and some of these other careers were uh, kind of amplified when you're younger, you could do the same with politicians, right? And, and get people to want to do that career again. And then I think uh, secondly is just, creating a structure where they're allowed to invest, right? Because you don't want the free market to, to, to basically kick them out of, and you want them to have that financial upside. Otherwise, people aren't going to want to do it either. So is it a blind trust? Is it something else? Maybe. But you got to figure out that structure of what works best for politicians. Yeah, the, the idea would basically be, uh, it probably doesn't make sense for us to say, like, like journalists a lot of times will say, hey, I'm trying to be unbiased. Now, we've talked at length about the fact that there are no unbiased people in the world, but they're, they're trying to be unbiased. And so they'll say, I won't hold individual stocks. Instead, what I'll do is I'll only only invest in low cost uh, mutual funds or index funds. So I'll buy the S&P 500. It's just whatever the stock market does, that's what I get. I get kind of beta of exposure to the financial markets, but I'm not gonna sit here and decipher, should I buy Disney, Tesla, Ford, or Amazon, right? I'm gonna simply just take whatever the market gives me. And so that is one way that they try to remove bias or, or kind of financial incentive uh, from covering this stuff. Now, what becomes really, really kind of gray area in my mind is if politicians are holding stock, whether long or short, of companies that they specifically are governing 
or being incentivized to quote unquote cover. Now the cover isn't journalistic coverage, but what it happens if you sit on a healthcare um, you know, board or, or on a uh, committee inside of Congress that's focused on public health care, and then you're over here buying with leverage or options the stocks of the largest healthcare companies in the industry. That all of a sudden would become pretty crazy. So if we look at this, and, and this is uh, is pretty crazy to be honest, uh, this is not the Tesla one, but these are some of the examples of the actual uh, options purchases that are occurring. Now remember, these people are worth over $120 million, $115 million net worth, uh, and they're buying one to $5 million options on things like Alphabet, right? And this happened in uh, June of 18, in May, uh, or I'm sorry, June 18th, this happened back in May. Well, yeah, most of them are uh, in May and June on, on this specific report. With just this context, not a big deal, whatever, you're, at, you're investing. When you add in the context that Paul Pelosi is a real estate investor and a venture capitalist, and he's not necessarily a public market trader, like, like again, if he was a hedge fund manager, and this is what he did for a living, and he was just like, hey, I'm just doing what I've always done, okay. But when you're a real estate investor, a venture capital investor, if you're going and you're literally you know, doing this kind of derivatives trading in the public markets, a little bit weirder. But the one that like really, I think, put people over the edge, and I hope I think I got this right, is that uh, Paul Pelosi bought $1 million in Tesla equity or options, and then the president signed an electric vehicle credit bill the next day, yeah. right? That, I think, is when people get real like, wait a minute, one day before you just happen to do it? And then if that happens multiple times, then people start to really kind of scratch their head and say, what is going on here? Well, I think people, they're looking for basically like, they don't want what happens in kind of like China or something like that, where the the government buys shorts on a stock and then they immediately go and do an investigation, stock plummets, and they cash in. Well, if you said in a different way, the house, uh, the speaker of the house, the, her husband made millions of dollars on a stock transaction on something that falls under her legislation and under her control, right? So she has kind of uh, material and non-public information or knowledge about this. So when you frame it like that, I think there's, you know, a little more, uh, you know, maybe frustration or anger put behind it. But it goes back to what we were saying earlier, like there needs to be rules in place. Technically, he didn't break the law. He didn't do anything wrong. People may question the validity of it to some degree, uh, but those rules need to be amended and change, right? If you're going to argue about them and say that it should be illegal or should be done differently or blind trust or whatever, they're just doing what they can with the rules they're given. Should we make a new rule? Do we need a new rule? No talking at the dinner table. If you're a politician, <laughs> you can't talk at the dinner table. Not allowed when you see your spouse. Yeah. Like, like, is that the solution? I, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> it, it, maybe he's only trading from the office, he says, right? <laughs> <laughs> the home computer doesn't yeah. actually do any trades. Yeah. No, the, the other piece of this too, and, and, and I want to kind of present the counter uh, argument here, is I think it was a Bloomberg piece uh, that really caught out and said, hey, like, uh, the, I think the article actually started with, what did it, what did it say? Like, uh, there's nothing to worry about or there's nothing wrong here, right? Yeah, there's Which, absolutely nothing wrong. <laughs> yeah, so anytime that the unbiased media starts to tell you there's nothing wrong, don't look here, look elsewhere, like you immediately kind of, uh, where there's smoke, there might be fire. But in the article, they do make one great point um, that, that I think is a, a fair kind of critique of the uh, people who are complaining, which is, look, uh, some of these options are expiring now and they're actually rolling off and, and they're being forced to exercise them. And they would have been exercised whether he did it or his financial advisor. And they did were long term in nature. They yeah. were long term. Right. So literally they were bought 12 to 18 months ago and they were things like uh, uh, Paul Pelosi went long on a, a options trade of tech companies when the stocks crashed, which millions or maybe not millions, but but tens of thousands of people in the market did when that occurred. And so it's really hard to make the argument that somebody knew what was going to happen 12 to 18 months away. Right. And they were basically buying options today because of that event 12 to 18 months from now. Sure, could it happen? Absolutely. But that, that's a little bit tougher sell than things like you bought a million dollars in Tesla uh, equity or options. And then the very next day, <laughs> the president signs uh, electric vehicle bill. And so I think that's the balance here is we're not claiming that uh, everything is bad. We're just claiming that at, at the absolute least, the optics are bad. And if the optics are bad, then the people may grow to distrust the politicians because they believe that the politicians are literally day trading, which by all means, that's essentially what's happening. U.S. average households YOLOing into stocks. P 
politicians YOLOing with options into stocks during this. And so at some point, do we say, you know what? Rather than continue to allow this gray area and allow all of this kind of confusion, why don't we just tell every politician, hey, you can continue to have exposure to financial assets. We don't think that you should be punished for being a politician. We actually want you to build a life of wealth because therefore there'll be less corruption and, and all that. But the way that you're gonna have to do it is you can't make the actual investment decisions while you are legislating over these companies. And so instead what you have to do is you have to give your wealth to somebody else for them to manage the capital and you cannot communicate to them what they should be doing. So pick wisely, but you can still have that financial exposure. You just have to let somebody else make the decisions. Like to me, that's the most common sense way to allow both sides to kind of find compromise, still get financial exposure without introducing all this kind of craziness that keeps occurring. Is that a one size fits all? What do you mean? Like. So that's got to be the president, his entire family, the house, everyone, everyone down to the lowest level of uh, of government officials. Well, I, I think your point is even better when you start to say if that's what you're going to do in the public markets, what do you do in the private markets? Right. So, for example, you can't invest. Well, well, okay. So here's like a really r ridiculous example. Joel Olstein, he <laughs> yeah, he says all of a sudden he's going to run for governor of uh, Texas, right? And when he runs for governor of Texas, he wins. Does Joel Olstein now all of a sudden have to put somebody else in place to run his business, right? Trump, they had this whole issue with him. Was he going to take his businesses, put them in blind trusts or not, right? Could his kids run the businesses versus him, right? Again, the public market is much easier and cleaner because there's kind of transparency around buying and selling and doing all this. When you start to introduce private businesses, it becomes even more complex. It becomes harder to actually track what's the value of the business, right? Well, value the business what, what someone's willing to pay, right? And so you start to get into this very, very kind of uh, uh, non-easily solvable situation. And that's where I think politicians at some degree are just saying, look, I'm not doing anything wrong, right? I'm here to do my job. Leave me alone. Yeah. yeah. But I think people might have a couple of complaints though.